Hey guys, and welcome to the video. This is part two, a continuation from yesterday's Hacking Modding Monday news and info. Today we will focus on that big Nintendo leak that happened over the weekend, plus 3DS stuff, as well as Switch stuff, and one or two miscellaneous things. RetroPie finally giving support to the Pi 4, and some other things here and there. If you are new to these segments, make sure that you look down in the description to get a brief summary on what they are all about. And this video stretched a little bit longer than I would like in terms of time, but I did not want to do a third part because I have so many other videos to do. So just sit back, relax, grab some snacks. Let's jump into it and cover that big Nintendo leak that happened over the weekend. And we start off with some huge news that you are probably already aware of, and that is the massive leak that Nintendo experienced over this past weekend. Nintendo is not new to leaks, but this is their biggest one yet. And it revolves mainly around their legacy systems like the Wii, the GameCube, and the Nintendo 64. The amount of information that was obtained by hackers reportedly is around two terabytes, and it includes the complete source code for all three systems. There's a SDKs, you know, the system development kits that they got there. Apparently, there's even um, the prototypes of games that were never released that was there and just a mountain of information uh, that Nintendo was storing in those servers. And I think they were using a third party company to do it. Anyway, what this means for the homebrew hacking and pirate scenes is that this information can be used to create these emulators that can run pretty much perfectly. You can run the games without having to worry about compatibility issues. And that I know has been a big deal with especially the N64 that has been pretty much a headache over years and decades. Well, now you can make an emulator that <laughs> runs the games perfectly, but even better, why even make an emulator with the constraints of that hardware when you can just port it over to a PC or your Linux based system or whatever. And now you're not confined by the limitations of the old hardware. Now you can use your new up to date hardware. We saw an example of this. I showed it to you yesterday with Super Mario 64, the PC port that was shown in 4K and it looked fantastic. It ran great and it ran like a native game made for Windows, no emulator necessary. Also modding on these games would be a hell of a lot easier. It would pretty much on PCs make emulators for Wii, GameCube, and the N64 completely obsolete because why would you need them? You now have the resources of your system and a lot more that can be done with these games. So over the next weeks and months, I'm sure we're gonna see even more ports of games, mods for those games, maybe some fresh new one-to-one -one faithful emulators being made, never release prototypes of games and demos, and a whole lot more. Anyway, as this stuff develops and comes out, you know I will keep you guys up to date. And let's kick off the Switch scene where we're gonna be at for a little while with the SIG patches situation again. And I know this has people frustrated over the past couple of weeks, things have changed. And I know there's quite a few people out there who are confused and whatnot. I did do a video recently and it helped quite a few people. However, things have been changing, so I need to make an updated video, which I will within the next couple of days. In the meantime, if you wanna find out more information about atmosphere and these new SIG patches, why changes have been made and how they work and whatnot. There's a great guide right here, which of course I'll link down in the description. It also tells you which SIG patches you have to use depending on your situation, how you launch atmosphere and whatnot, whether you use it with Hecate or Cosmos. So yeah, it's a really good read. It should take you about five to 10 minutes to go over it. In that upcoming video, I will pretty much be summarizing all of the this up anyway because that one will show you what you need to do to get everything working again and which sig patches you need to use in what situation 
Uh, if you come here, you will see these updated patches here. The Fusey Zip is for those who are just using plain Jane vanilla um, atmosphere. The Hecate Zip is for those who use Hecate to launch atmosphere. Or if you use Cosmos, then these are the ones you want. If you want less headaches and you want everything to work, update to 10.0.2. If you use Cosmos, get the latest one, which as of right now is 16.0, and use these patches here. And trust me, it'll just save you a ton of frustration. But I'll be explaining that in the upcoming video. All right, guys, and the updates continue, starting with Tegra Explorer. We've talked about this before. This is a payload based file manager for your Switch. This doesn't work like a regular applet file manager. It's injected into the Switch, and because of that, you get more features, more options, more controls that you would not get with a regular applet based file manager. You can see here the improvements that have been made in this update, and then you can grab the bin file from here that you would inject. Then we have Haku 33, and this is pretty interesting. This is a homebrew that allows you to perform a hard reset of the switch, but the kicker here is that it clears out everything, including all the CFW stuff left behind. So even when you do a reset of the switch, if you've had custom firmware installed in it, you still have traces of that stuff left behind, and this will clear all of that out. It will not not unban your switch. So if for some reason you have a switch that has been or is currently on custom firmware and you just want to start over from fresh or you just want to make it a 100% legit switch again without the fear of getting banned, then this is what you would use. Next, we have an update to Simple Mod Manager. This is for those of you out there who use layered FS in order to install mods into a game. Now, of course, this doesn't work with every game. There's only some games that have mods for them that required layered FS. And what this does is it allows you to control all of these mods from your game or various games you have installed. You can activate which mods you want, deactivate the ones you don't. It's just a nice way to keep everything organized and be able to activate and deactivate things kind of like on the fly. It works very well. So again, only those of you who use layered FS will benefit from it, but it's a nice, clean, organized way to keep all of your game mods tidy and in order and being able to use them in a nice convenient way. This latest update adds checksum support. They fixed a couple of things and whatnot. The Nero file is down at the bottom. And then we have an update to Retro Reloaded. I've talked about this before in the past. This is a boot manager that allows you to boot whichever custom firmware you want to use at the time. You can boot Hecate, you can get your keys from here and just a ton of other stuff. If you've never used this before, absolutely 100% read the instructions because there's a one-time thing that you have to do to set everything up. And it's also a little bit different for those of you who are going to just update. The latest release pretty much just adds support for the latest firmware and the latest atmosphere. You got the latest um, Hecate and Nix on there as well. Make sure again that you read everything before you use and or update this. All right, and moving on, we have an update to bitmap printer. What this allows you to do is that when you press the capture button on your switch, instead of saving a compressed JPEG image, an uncompressed RGB bitmap image is saved instead to the SD card, of course, because it's uncompressed, it's going to be larger, but maybe this may give you uh, more detail on your images that you are seeking. I don't think there's any confirmation once you press the button that the image has been taken. I think that's what I read. Anyway, if you want to give it a try, you grab the zip file and copy and paste everything to the root of your SD card. Next, we have a another update to switch theme injector. Again, this is something we've covered many times, which allows you to change the theme of your switch and even the layout of your home menu and a bunch of stuff. I want to do a detailed tutorial series on this, which I'm going to do soon. Anyway, 
when you go to the latest releases you'll see here that mainly what's been updated it's just its compatibility with the latest firmware and here's something that just came out literally a couple of hours ago and that's an update to Hecate another one this is now 5.2.1 Nix has been updated to 0.9.1 as well there's various fixes and additions here so if you recently updated your Hecate to that 5.2.0 make sure that you update to this one so you can take advantage of the fixes and things that have been added and improved here they added things like colorize icons support there's a readme file right here to give you more information regarding that and various other things that definitely warrant you updating to this latest version you can grab the zip file right from here for those of you who are going to use the universal media server along with your switch make sure you grab this reg file here because you'll need to put that in your pc and if you are going to use ums make sure you read the notes section here that will help you with setting things up all right, and next up here to round up the Switch scene, we have this, a Mana Plus port for the Switch. This is Mana, the Mana World, and it's an innovative and free open source MMORPG. It uses old school uh, retro 2D style graphics. It has a large and diverse interactive world, and because it's open source, it constantly keeps getting added to and improved and all that good stuff. There is a lot that you can do here, and if you're interested, you can grab the client from this first link here up on top, and the second link contains like the installation instructions and the uh, key configuration and all that stuff for your Switch. If you scroll down a little bit, you'll find this video here, which shows the game in action. And even though it's the PC version, the Switch version looks pretty much exactly the same. All right, and now let's head on over to the 3DS scene, where first we get an update to Luma 3DS. Those of you who have a modded system more than likely have the Luma custom firmware running. This version fixed a bug and also uh, made a few minor changes. You can grab the zip file from here. And then we have an update to unsafe mode. This is something that I covered last time. It's a relatively new way to run a newer exploit to be able to install custom firmware on to pretty much any 2DS or 3DS system. The thing is here is that you do have to have a Wi-Fi connection because you have to download a free game from the eShop. There's quite a few steps involved in order to do this. Luckily, Statix did a tutorial. It's about 21 minutes long and he walks you through the whole process. So I will link both of these things down in the description and you can grab the newer release from here. Just follow his instructions if you plan on doing this. All right, and lastly for the 3DS scene, and this affects the Wii U as well, the eShop is going to be permanently shut down in various places in Latin America and in the Caribbean. There is a list of the regions and countries that will be affected by this. It's listed right here. This is not a global thing. Mexico and Brazil are not going to be affected by it, but many other areas and countries are, like the Bahamas, Barbados, Bermuda, Venezuela, US Virgin Islands, the Cayman Islands, Chile, Colombia, Costa Rica, Dominican Republic, Ecuador, El Salvador, and just a whole host others. So this could be the first phase in Nintendo moving on to maybe shut down the eShop for those two systems globally. I mean, we know it's going to happen or maybe not. Maybe it'll stay open for years to come. Who knows? But what's interesting here is that many people have asked with older uh, consoles and handhelds where you bought digital content from what's going to happen when those systems get taken offline like when the ps3 goes permanently offline and the xbox 360 the vita what's going to happen well nintendo at least for the 3ds and the wii u have said well make sure you download everything that you purchase by july 31st because after that you will not have access to it anymore at least not in those 
places. So we don't know if other companies will follow suit. The PS5 is supposed to be backwards compatible with like every version of PlayStation. Maybe Sony will let people who have purchased digital content for PS3 and PS4 sign in to their accounts through PS5 servers and then you can download the games from there but of course you have to have a PS5 and that would give people more initiative to actually buy one anyway I don't know who knows that's just an idea but it's pretty interesting that Nintendo has taken this stance on what people have to do with their digital content before their deadline and what happens when your system stops working and then you get another one and it's after July 31st and you need to get access to your content again? Well, you'll just be out of luck. And a couple of miscellaneous mentions to wrap things up. First, another update to DS4 Windows, and this is something I've talked about a lot in the past before. This is just a program that you use on your PC to be able to use your PS4 controllers on your PC, either wireless or connected to your PC directly with a USB cable. There is always seems to be some kind of updates being done to this at least every week. They keep adding and fixing things. And I've been using this program for, I don't know, years already. And it's super easy to set up and use. There are a bunch of tutorials out there already for it. And lastly, RetroPie finally comes out with support for the Raspberry Pi 4. I've had my Pi 4 since what, July of last year, and a lot of us in the community have been waiting for this. Now, even though the Pi 4 support is beta, it seems to be working extremely well. There's all kinds of links here on how to install this for the first time, how to install this over um, an existing uh, Raspbian Buster setup and things like that. So make sure you read up on it. Plus, since it is beta for the Raspberry Pi 4, they do want you to use it and report any bugs or issues. Some people have already been showcasing videos um, on this on their Pi 4 and it just looks great. And many of the games are running fantastic. Even the ones that tend to use a little bit more of the resources, but since the Pi 4, especially the four gig model has a little bit more oomph, the games look great. Can't wait to try it out. And that is gonna do it for this week's episode, guys. You know I appreciate you watching. And if you found anything here informative, useful, helpful or maybe just entertaining or you just want to throw some love or appreciation to the channel of course the best way to do that as always is just to hit that like button and maybe subscribe if you haven't already much love going out to everyone be careful out there be safe but have fun and we will see you on the next one